this is Mike and you're listening to Feeling Twisty. I'm really glad you're here. I hear people joking about how awful this year is. And I see memes on Facebook, I'm sure you do too, all about how 2020 is <laughs> punishing us, uh, making light of all the stuff that's been going on this year. Many people find something to laugh about, and I do too. Many others, though, look for anything to be afraid of. A friend of mine asked me to talk about fears in this episode. He says he has an intense fear of elevators, and since he lives on the 16th floor of his apartment, he has a visceral response every time he leaves uh, or enters his apartment. I understand that. Uh, Not necessarily elevators, but I understand fear. There have been things that have struck fear in my heart through my life, and I'm sure you too. Back when I was 13, I was diagnosed with anorexia. My pediatrician told my mom when I was 10 years old that I was morbidly obese and that I had to lose weight or I'd die. So my mom, uh, being the sweet lady she is, signed me up for one of those weight loss centers. Uh, And I learned so much about calories. (laughs) I didn't know anything about calories, but I, I came to fear calories back then. Uh, Nothing about carbohydrates or proteins or fats or anything like that. But that's all they talked about. Cut the calories. They really didn't focus on anything but that. So we started cutting calories. I hated it for the first year. But then I started really losing weight. And uh, it got fun, you know, seeing the weight drop off of me. I liked that. I'd gotten down about uh, 20 pounds or so when I went in for a weekly weigh-in at the diet center and I stepped on the scale and it showed that I gained half a pound from the Friday before. The weight loss coach, and I'm using coach advisedly here, started grilling my mom, asking her what she was feeding me because a half a pound of weight gain is bad, very bad, very, very bad. (laughs) The only thing that my mom could think of was that I'd taken two children's aspirin the day before. And the weight loss coach said, that's it. The sugar and the aspirin made him gain the half pound. Well, when I heard that, I thought, if two little aspirin can make me gain weight, then I just have to stop eating. And that's what I did. I would eat a slice of, uh, what was that bread back in the early 80s called less bread? It was sugar-free bread. Oh, it was awful. It's like eating a sponge. But I would eat one slice of less bread and a pickle daily. That's what I would eat. That's it. I had become so afraid of food. I never wanted to go to any parties where food would be served and no restaurants. I dreaded vacations because that means we'd we'd be uh, around food all the time. And I dreaded my days because if I was awake, that meant I was going to be hungry. And then I I was going to have to avoid food because food was bad. I was doing violence to my desires and my body. I ended up going from 149 pounds to 70 pounds over the course of those two or three years. Now, I was only like four foot seven. I was very short. So uh, I was short and round <laughs> when I was 10 years old. But uh, I, was, uh, I looked like a skeleton. I looked like uh, bones with skin stretched across it when I'd gotten down to 70 pounds. But of course, I still thought I was fat. My self-image, my self-concept was so distorted, and that's what I kept experiencing. And I was terrified of food. I eventually started putting on weight and eating closer to normal. But how I felt about food stayed with me for years, well into my adulthood, most of my life. Now I'm perfectly happy with food. Neville says God gave us a palate for a reason, to enjoy it. And that's what I do now. I have this body. I'm not this body. But when this body desires a certain food, I feed it. I'm not afraid of food or anything, really. Well, I must admit, my, uh, my heart does race when my son, Mac, jumps out of a dark corner to scare me at night. <laughs> we'll lie and wait for each other, trying to see who can make the other jump the highest. But in my core, I do not fear. I cannot. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. The Greek word translated as timidity means cowardice. And God is, I am. Who I really am is love, not fear or cowardice. I didn't do anything like a specific technique to get over my fear of food or my concept of self. 
this change in state came with an expanded understanding of who I really am. Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world. The light I produce, what I am conscious of being, and what I hold true for others is what I will experience. I am the light, and I supply the images to experience. And so do you. I grew up in a very rural area. We had farmland all around us. We, didn't, we weren't on a farm, but farmland all around us. Rice fields, soybean fields, and cattle pastures mostly. We always had snakes around because of that. My father and brother and I would go out sometimes and just shoot snakes for fun in the ditch. Now, I don't know the mind of my brother or father, but I believed the only good snake was a dead snake, <laughs> at least until a few years ago. I had a vivid dream one night. I was riding in the back seat of uh, a tuk-tuk in Thailand, riding on the outskirts of a city. I looked down and there was a big green, a vibrant green snake at my feet. And I screamed in terror. I was so gripped by fear. I was frozen right there in my seat. And the snake, sensing my fear, launched and bit my right arm. I didn't wake up at the bite. I sat there staring at it, locked onto my arm. And there was no pain. I said, well, of course it doesn't hurt. This is only a dream. And when I said this is only a dream, I woke up. Now, when I woke up, my heart was pounding. <laughs> but I didn't like how I reacted in my dream. So I decided to revise it. I fell back to sleep and found myself back in the same tuk-tuk, going around the same city. And there was this beautiful green snake, the same snake. It was in the same place it was in the first dream, at my feet. We looked at each other and I said, I love you. And I really felt it. Nothing but perfect love for this creature. At that, it slithered up my leg and coiled itself around my right arm. We completed the ride in the tuk-tuk with this beautiful new friend of mine riding with me on my arm. I overcame my fear of snakes with love. God is love. God is within me. My awareness of being. I am. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment. The one who fears has not been perfected in love. Fear cannot abide in love. It just can't. Knowing that now, anytime I notice I'm afraid, no matter what it is, I love. Like with the snake, I love it. I feel the reality of love for that creature or person or circumstance. I saturate my feelings with love. And by doing that, fear has no place within me. Right now, our emergency officials are holding a press conference talking about Hurricane Laura and how bad it's going to be. They're saying at the moment that our city is in the worst possible position for it, the northeast quadrant, where all the rain and storm surge and the high, high winds come. Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread? Well, the Lord is my light. And in the New Testament, that other verse says, I am the light of the world. So the Lord is within me. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. The Lord, I am, our God, our I am, is one Lord, one I am. Knowing that, what or whom can I fear? Of course, I do enter or I can enter a state and become frightened by all sorts of things. As I'm recording, I'm getting notified right now that government officials have issued a mandatory evacuation order for our city. But I just can't be afraid. I'm not saying that uh, like I'm resisting it or fighting it. No, I can't let myself be afraid. No, I'm just, it's impossible in this moment, in this state, to be afraid. Not the state of Louisiana, but the state of consciousness. I cannot be afraid. In the lecture, Our Real Beliefs Are What We Live By, Neville says, Do I really believe that imagining creates reality? If I do, I could not worry. For worry is to conjure what I fear in this world. For worry is an imaginal act. I couldn't possibly be concerned about anything if I really believed that imagining creates reality. 
And I do believe that. I know it beyond any doubt. Any fear comes from a state of consciousness, a body of beliefs. The first principle, be still and know I am God, is life-giving. If or, or when I find my thoughts are drifting toward all the awful things that can happen, uh, I'm not talking about the storm, I'm talking about in general, in life, I stop. I get still. If I'm doing something like driving or walking through the grocery store, I don't close my eyes, but I just take a deep breath and I let it out. And in that moment, I'm getting back into the first principle, automatically shedding the state from which the fear was coming. Then I move back into the state of my choice and I carry on. This is going to be a shorter episode. I'm getting messages as I'm recording from family members who don't live here, but they want to know what's going on and uh, if we're going to evacuate. So I'm going to end it right here. I love you. I really do. This is Feeling Twisty. Thank you.